Mr. Mahaludunyas Falcha, good afternoon everyone and welcome. This is the twelfth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing of uh, 2018. Uh, we have apologies from Daniel Johnson. Agenda item number one is cyber kiosks. Uh, and our business today is taking an evidence session on Police Scotland's proposed use of digital device triage systems, more commonly referred to as cyber chaos. Now, I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome uh, to the meeting uh, Diego Quiros, Policy Officer, Scottish Human Rights uh, Commission, Detective Chief Superintendent uh, Jerry McLean, Head of Organised Crime and Counterterrorism, Police Scotland, David Freeland, Senior Policy Officer, UK Information Commissioner's Office, and Claire Connolly, Advocate, who's representing the Faculty of Ag Advocates, and thank you for your, your contribution. Uh, I'd like to thank members for the written submissions, and as always, that's very helpful. And maybe if I kick off questions uh, to yourself, uh, Mr McLean. Uh, the, the subcommittee first considered this matter on the, the 10th of May, and this is now our fourth occasion of considering it. Um, the initial questions were all around the, the legal basis in which this would take place. Um, somewhat surprised and disappointed that we don't have something definitive in front of us regarding the legal position that Police Scotland believe supports their deployment of these devices. Can you update us on that, please? Yes, I can, Convener. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me along to give evidence today. I think uh, when I last gave evidence in front of the committee, there were a number of substantive points, and as you have said, Convener, one of them was around about uh, establishing the legal basis, as well as some other matters maybe we'll discuss later. Um, we are obviously confident of the legal basis in which Police Scotland applies the law in relation to digital forensics at this time, and I think I, in part, tried to give that assurance at the committee the last time. Um, since that date, we have written to Crown Office, um, and that was addressed from our, one of our Chief Officers, who is the Senior Responsible Officer for the Cyber Programme, which this is, is part of the delivery of. Uh, and also, we have taken legal advice internally within Police Scotland from the Legal Services Department. Um, we still await uh, a response from Crown Office. I have spoken with representatives um, as recently as yesterday. And my understanding is that that has been considered at a senior official level within Crown Office, both across their policy division, their cybercrime division and their serious crime um, unit. Um, in terms of the basis that I articulated here to the committee before, uh, we put that to our own legal services team and they support that position, which uh, in, in summary is the powers that I've I hopefully described to the, to the committee before, but I accept across some of the document sets to this committee and wider, we have to be clearer in terms of how we articulate that. And those powers are such that when we take devices, when we search, seize and retain devices under a warrant, powers conferred by the court, um, and also under some statutory provisions, and I think I've provided some examples to the committee around the types of legislation that's available to us, for example, Firearms Act, the Misuse of Drugs Act. But more particularly, the advice that was given to is that it's really important for us to make that distinction to all concerned of the different, uh, I don't want to say categories, but distinctions between what is a victim and a witness, where there is no compulsion on the part of those individuals to hand over their devices, and that needs to be on a voluntary basis. And where we do have some powers, which um, as recently as 2016, I think were enacted by this, this building, um, in terms of the Criminal Justice Act 2016, which allows for arrested persons, so suspects or accused, but um, arrested now under that piece of legislation for us to search and seize any items that are in their possession at that time. So that's the statutory provision that underpins some of the other um, statutory provisions open to us. Um, and also in relation to all arrested persons, the Criminal Justice Act allows us to search and seize items from those individuals if it's not powers conferred by the court in terms of a warrant. The investigation of crime in Scotland, that's uh, undertaken, um, Lord Advocate's in charge of that and the Police Scotland undertake it on the behalf of the Lord Advocate. Is it not somewhat surprising that given that, and everyone wants to facilitate the thorough investigation of crime, that there, there isn't something as simple as a, a letter here confirming your understanding of the position? Because people will make the clear distinction between, you know, statutory uh, authority to... Uh, investigate under some of the legislation you've mentioned, the common law, and the very, most of the concerns are about um, complainers, witnesses. Are you not surprised, given that we commenced this on the 10th of May, that a committee of the Parliament has nothing to confirm that uh, the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service support your position? 
Well, firstly, convener, I mean, I recognise the frustration of the committee around about that. I think the position may well be described as, as not being a binary position of whether there is legislation or not, um, but that Scottish law is based on a number of principles and often competing principles. So what I've tried to describe in, in front of the, the committee here before is some of the statutory provisions that are allowed to police, some of those conferred through warrants, um, uh, as well as um, some of the competing demands around about that and how we are trying to apply the law available to us at this time. So I think it's a complex issue. Some of it is examined in the courts through case law. And again, I think we've referred to that previously at this committee room. And again, that's what supports the legal basis that we think we are uh, empowered to, to undertake digital forensics and, and thereby the potential role of kiosks in the future. And uh, have you had individual discussions? I mean, as, as, have you discussed matters with the Crown Office, Mr McLean? Not discussions, really just follow-up discussions about when we may well get some direction or a response from Crown Office. And the answer to that was, please? Um, it is under consideration. OK. Uh, Mr Kiros, you on? Thank you. Um, <coughs> I, I hope the committee is now tired to, to hear from, from me. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. And um, I, I think I totally agree. I think it's a, a, a very complex issue, and, and, and that's uh, why we are asking for um, uh, the clarity, and, and, and there is a need of clarity. I think it's important to state from the beginning that the lawfulness of, of, of this te technique is highly um, fact-dependent. And uh, however, we can say that there is no legal basis where it is outside of the context of a warrant. And, and this is because it entails a significant interference with Article 8 rights which is not accompanied by the required legal certainty and the adequate safeguards against abuse and arbitrariness. So uh, I think that's, that's important to, to acknowledge. So uh, these techniques and, and, the, and the legal basis uh, argued by, by the police, police appears to be founded on, on a wide and number of contexts and, and statutory provisions. And, arising on, on, on many different circumstances. And this makes the legality uh, highly fact-dependent and is it quite reasonable and foreseeable to, to say that uh, therefore we don't have legal basis for such uh, examinations of mobile phones. Um, yeah. Ms Conley, would you, would you care to comment on Yes, I, I, I also have some sympathy for Police Scotland and Crown Office in terms of um, being able to present to you um, a, a robust legal framework which legitimises what is proposed here. And, and we're not the first jurisdiction to face this problem. In 2013, Mr Justice Cromwell, a Canadian Supreme Court judge, highlighted that the traditional legal framework um, that, that would surround search of p individuals and their property requires updating in order to protect the unique privacy interests that are st at stake in computer searches. Be and the reason for that is because the search of a computer, and of course smartphones are computers, is not the same as searching a cupboard or a filing cabinet. And a warrant that's granted to allow, for example, an office to be searched is, it has the ability to set very strict parameters on that. When you access a person's mobile phone, you don't only access what is contained within the device in your hand, but that is a gateway um, to the cloud and to external sources of information. And, and I think that the challenge here, and perhaps the, the fact that Police Scotland have returned a number of times and they don't have that clear legal framework that you're looking for, is in fact reflective of the complexity. And, and what we've seen in case law so far is that the Scottish courts, when it comes to, for example, examining um, mobile devices, that they rely on the traditional legal approach. And in my respectful submission, that traditional legal approach is not fit for purpose. And this is a matter that requires to be looked at again. A supplementary from Stuart. Um, <clears throat> I, I wonder if the complexities might be susceptible to try and granularising the issue. And I want to do it in a particular way. Is there a different set of law that applies to the seizing 
of a phone and, the sub and then the subsequent searching. Because clearly, I can logically, and this is not a legal statement, logically see that it makes sense to seize a phone to protect it because it would be interfered with under some circumstances, even if there might have to be a legal process to then allow its searching of that phone, it, just as the police might secure premises but not have a right to enter and search them to, to create the model. Is that a reasonable way to look at this problem, that really it isn't a single problem, it's a sort of sequence of different legal competencies or questions that need to be asked, and I think seizing and searching sounds like two useful headings. Am I right or am I wrong in looking at it that way? I think that that would be a reasonable approach. I mean, what underpins both of them is that we are dealing with, with current technology, and the reg legal regulation of that is the application of laws that, when they were developed, could not have envisaged that we'd have this level of technology. And I think another difficulty is that when it comes to those who are perhaps making determinations about admissibility of evidence, they're old people like me, who use their phone to telephone people and perhaps a push manage to send a text, as opposed to my teenage children, who use these devices in a very different way. So if, 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 if you were to ask someone who, whose mobile phone usage reflected my own, then I would say, well, it's probably not that much of an invasion of my privacy compared to doing other things that have always been done. But, but there is a huge gap, a generational gap, in how these devices are used also. And therefore, there's a difficulty in assuming that there's a safety around investigation of these devices because they don't really hold very much information. Thank you. Liam? Yeah, just picking up on Ms Connolly and I suppose Mr Kiros's, um responses there, we've, we've entered into this debate in relation to kiosk, but it strikes me that what we're discussing could be equally applicable in a sense to what's been happening traditionally in, in relation to, to hubs. I mean, is that a fair, is that a, a fair assumption to make? I, I think it's slightly different. So when, for example, a computer tower goes to a hub, the, the, hub, the, the tower itself isn't switched on. So what happens is that the, the hard drive of the, the, the tower is imaged, and then there's interrogation and search around that image. So and it only allows you to search what is contained within the memory of the tower. So at no point would you switch on the computer because that then it's, there's an interference process goes on. The difficulty with the kiosks, or one of the difficulties in my respectful submission, is that the kiosks turn the phones on. And therefore, you have a gateway then to not only what is stored on the SIM or equivalent memory device within that electronic mobile phone or whatever it is, but you can access the, the, the web, you can access um, externally stored data in a way that you can't from the imaging of a computer tower. And having, having had this process and the difficulties arising from it in a fraud trial, I know very well that when the imaging was done and we were given the imaging, and we had to say, well, what do we do with this? Because you have to then use programs to be able to read the image. Uh, so McLean was oh, right, sorry, yeah. shaking his head about some aspects, maybe it right, helped. Yeah, no, that'd be helpful, yeah. Thank you, Kim. If it's helpful for the, the committee and others, it's just a, um, some points of accuracy around about that. Um, if I may, and I'll try not to take much, too much time, but to come back to Mr Stevenson's point about is there a bespoke piece of legislation that covers this eventuality, I think collectively what we're seeing is no, there's an absence of that. Um, but that's why I described that landscape as being quite complex, but a set of principles. Um, I refer to the 2016 piece of legislation, the Criminal Justice Act. I suppose that's to cover most eventualities for an arrested person. But it, it does give the power to search and to seize. Um, now, when you start to question that, you question, seize any material, you know, about a power to examine it. Uh, in, in terms to my esteemed colleague's uh, piece about a filing cabinet or, or storage, uh, as a point of accuracy, the kiosks when examining devices, that device will be switched off and if it has a SIM card, that SIM card will be removed. So it will only be stored data, which then brings it very much in line with the case law, which has looked at stored data on devices. Uh, and found it to be that the, the police acted correct at those times in terms of using the powers to search those devices. But I accept the point about what devices in modern society bring. And one final thing, if I may, Convener. 
Um, so we've talked about the Article 8 um, implications. That's something that police work with every day, along with the other various articles, probably more particularly uh, the right to life. But in terms of Article 8, I think without going into a legal debate, it's important to note that that's not an absolute right. So there's the importance about the rule of law and the administration of law, and that can be an exception to the Article 8 rights. So when I talk about powers conferred by a warrant or by statutory for persons who have been arrested, then I think we can take consideration of the Article 8, but as I say, it's not an absolute right. Okay, I, I think that we have a number of people wanting in here. Liam, if, do, do you wish to come back, back I, in? I just remember, um, both Mr Freeland and Mr Gross were, were both kind of um, nodding along in, in agreement. I mean, is, is, is the view that the, the issue around the legal basis extends beyond simply um, uh, the, 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 the functioning um, of the, the, the kiosk process? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's even more serious and significant um, in terms of interference when it comes to, to the hubs. Um, so it extends. And, and, and the reason for that is because there is a extraction of the data, there is a retention, and there is a management issue. So involve uh, certainly the right to privacy, but, but of course, uh, data protection laws. So I, I would certainly agree with you. Yeah. Um, of the conversations that have been had with Crown Office suggests that what comes back by way of a formal response will will capture what Mr. Kiros has, has has just indicated in relation to the legal basis for um, the, the hub process as well as kiosk process. So, with respect, Mr. MacArthur, I wasn't supposed to speak on behalf of Crown Office, but I think it's a valid point. But actually, I would you know would support what Mr. Kiros is saying there. The the intention about introducing the, the cyber kiosks is about to introduce a triage process to stop so many devices going to the cyber hubs. Um, but again, the legal basis for either of those systems is, is as in law as I've described previously. Mr Freeland and, yes, and then Mark. Um, I absolutely agree. You know, if, if the more devices are filtered out, then you know less of a privacy intrusion. But that doesn't then get away from some of the data protection risks that are inherent in the hub itself, and with the volume of data and questions over the relevance of all the data that is then processed uh, in that in the, the cyber hubs themselves. And that's that's a question that, that we're looking into. Um, as I said as, in our previous uh, committee meeting, as part of our investigation across the UK into these types of technology, and um, colleagues have also given evidence um, on this. In, in Westminster, um, that concern about the the volume and the relevance of, of the information that the police are processing from uh, modern uh, smartphones and, and mobile devices. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, if I could ask Mr. McLean, then um, are are you saying that you think the existing case law is sufficient to be able to back um, Police Scotland's power to both seize? and the process of looking at the data once the, the phone is seized? I think I was asked the question before at this committee whether or not I felt there was a legal basis and would I keep it under consideration. From the legal advice that we've taken internally, and we won't suppose what Crown Office would tell us, but from others, we have satisfied ourselves that there is a legal basis from the powers I've described for us to search and seize those, those items. Um, I think there's, there's a general agreement across colleagues who, who have supported some of the reference groups that uh, a modern society should always keep its laws under review um, and, and perhaps that we would, we would be accepting of that. And there's a number of complex issues that police have to manage within that legal basis, but we are satisfied at this time that the legal basis that is there has been tested through the criminal justice system. So in that case, then you would see no difficulty um, at present of passing the legal tests of foreseeability and accessibility? Yes, but what I would say about that is I think we have to be more explicit um, and I accept that with colleagues through the, the various groups and consultations that we've done, um, we may have been to the point of being ambiguous about what those powers are. So that's absolutely something. In terms of the quality of law, we need to be more explicit in what those powers are and who they're applicable to so that people have that foreseeable view of what the expectations of what the law can or cannot do to them and what rights they have around about that. So that's that distinction, I suppose, in some terms, it's that distinction between a victim and a witness or a suspect and an accused and what powers are available to the police. Whichever the situation is, then if there is some ambiguity there, I suggest there isn't the necessary clarity in the law that is absolutely essential surrounding this whole issue. I think there's a question about the clarity of the law, but I still think the legal basis is there to search and seize for the devices. 
all the data, and um, I think there are some. Well, I'll bring Mr. Kuros in here because I think you have, um, or the Human Rights Commission certainly has doubts about that and considers that there should, for example, be um, an oversight, an independent oversight of the use of NPB. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, I, I think because exactly what we are, all of us are saying, incredibly complex uh, framework and um, which applies in different uh, circumstances. So f from that, it's, it's quite difficult, if it's not impossible, to discern the legal powers that the police has to 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 use this technique by by itself, by by as as, as, the, as the member said, by just applying applying logic. So there is a lack of specificity of the current law. It does why we one of the things that we we asking is that the, there is a need for that required. Uh, for, for that uh, framework. Um, the, the, the second point that I wanted to, to come back, it was, was your point about the, the seizure of, of evidence. And, and, and I think the point here from a human rights perspective is that the, the, the items, the traditional items that are seized by, by, by the police cannot, cannot be uh, considered and and, and that application of those powers cannot can be considered and apply in in the case of um, um, mobile phones. So um, there are no separate powers for the examination of these items, and most of those most of those provisions that that, that you're referring are parasitic on on other powers. And um, so they they have different. That means that they have different meanings, and different purposes, and uh, and this seems to be all merged into one single. Uh, legal basis for, for the use of, of cyber cues here. And so this is particularly different when you when we are talking about electronic devices and that goes back to the point of, of the Canadian uh, Supreme Court cases and, and the US Supreme Court cases, which actually they, are, they, they clearly state and say, and is their thinking that when there, there are searches and, and, and examinations of mobile phones, they should be done uh, within a framework, a uh, legal framework, and that legal framework is, is a warrant. And there are only a very, very narrow circumstances when the, that, that in, in the case of Canada, when, when that searches can be done without, without a warrant, but it's, 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 it's depending on the, of the criminal offense. And certainly, uh, and the immediacy of, of, of the circumstances, and certainly minor offenses will not allow, and the Canadian Supreme Court is quite clear, Minor offences will not allow the the rational uh, or the use of um, mobile uh, extraction or web browsing um, without a warrant. If I could ask the other witnesses that that same question, do you think the legal basis is sufficient? And in particular, Mr. Freeland, um, uh, uh, it has been suggested that the rollout should be postponed. DCHR have um, suggested that because of their concerns, and I know that ICO say there should be no rollout before other documents and the data um, protection impact assessment, um, I suppose information is fairly in place. Um, well, we've now seen a copy of the, the data protection impact assessment and provided um, a substantive comment back to Police Scotland um, on a number of the issues which uh, Mr. McLean is, is taking that on board and hopefully we'll have a revised version of that. One of those the questions was uh, around the, the legal basis. It was not sufficiently clear to us what that basis was. I'm not an expert in criminal law, uh, so we do need uh, the, or the Police Scotland in this case to spell it out for us what that is. Um, and until that's there, then we can't say we can't be clear that it's lawful. And therefore, if it's not lawful, then data protection law says processing of personal data needs to be lawful. Um, and if we can't quite clearly evidence that, then then there is still that question and. You know, I would question whether it can go ahead. Um, and not to be an expert in human rights law either, but I will note that the law enforcement directive, the EU law enforcement directive, uh, that sets out the rules for processing personal data for law enforcement purposes contains in its recitals, or, or kind of reiterates that uh, member state law must be uh, precise, clear, uh, foreseeable and accessible. Uh, and, uh, as well to, to echo and in compliance with the uh, rulings of the uh, the EU courts and the, the European Court of Human Rights. And um, Ms Conley? Yeah, I think that the, the 2016 Act certainly empowers police officers to stop and search, 
But, but that doesn't necessarily give the protections, the Article 8 protections, that are clearly of concern across this panel and clearly of your own concern. And, and for that reason, I would say we do not have a fit-for-purpose legal framework in place at this moment to allow the rollout of this policy and the use of cyber kiosks without the Article 8 rights of individuals being interfered with. So, is it the position that the December rollout um, date is looking like a very suspect, certainly from the Human Rights Commission, the, commi uh, the, um, the human rights position, um, and also from the Commissioner's position in terms of the, the impact assessment data and other documents still to be received? We need clarity on a number of the key issues that, that we've all identified uh, to Police Scotland. So um, I, I don't think necessarily we should be putting dates on it, more as, as these issues are resolved. Um, then that's that's the, the, the gateway to, to roll out is, is resolving mm -hmm. these issues. And Mr McLean, is there a possibility that you think they can be resolved by December? I would have thought that was a very tall order. I think I did say before I was very ambitious, but perhaps that stretches the level of my ambition. I think, um, convener and committee, I th Police Scotland has is, is tried to be as transparent and try to consult as, as best it can with a range of partners, and we're extremely grateful for the contributions that they have made towards um, the considerations that clearly we have to do ahead of any planned rollout of, of cyber kiosks. I think there are still some substantive issues. I think clarity is, what is one of the key things in terms of either how we've positioned or articulated that. And, and in short, there's a real opportunity to try and get this right, but we have to do it in a very measured approach and try and get it right to the best of our ability in a very complex legal landscape. So. Um, I would probably concur with, with your view that December is very, very ambitious and there's still more work to be done. Um, and it's not the position of Police Scotland that it's roll out the kiosks at any cost. It's about trying to get all the document sets and allay the concerns of, of the, the people of Scotland and the people who have engaged with the stakeholder and reference groups. Briefly put it another way, um, rather than, you know, there's a need to get it right, I think there's dire consequences if you get it wrong, which would um, really, I think, jeopardise the whole the whole project, um, so maybe a little bit of not so much in haste and get it right, so make sure it's absolutely tight, the, the authority to look, to seize, and both to look at the data. Thank you. Um, Rona? Yeah, uh, just really following on from, from uh, Margaret's question, um, it was, my question was really for Ms Connolly, but it probably applies to everyone. Um, you were saying about, you know, basically old... <coughs> old legal framework being applied to new technology. In your um, opinion, do you think it needs new legislation or amended legislation at this point? I think it probably does, to be honest, because I don't think that we, it is, is um, possible or indeed reasonable to expect the, the, the common law, case law that exists to be developed um, in, in court process for something as important as this that's been flagged up in, in advance. Anyone? Up? Yes. Yeah, I think that's um, that's um, what we. I, I think I think the the point here is is to provide police Scotland and, and the police and, and other um, uh, authorities with with the uh, enforcement authorities with the adec adequate framework so they can do their the work that really important uh, work that they they do in and which, as I, I said before last week, is, is, is very much about protecting our human rights um, in, in a way that doesn't interfere with that job. So what we think is that there are significant issues in terms of lawfulness and the, the source of the law, the legal certainty, the foreseeability uh, of, of the law, um, and, and safeguards that the, 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 the convener uh, touch upon the safeguards in the law which are not uh, adequately provided in, in the current framework. So uh, there is a, a, a need for, for providing that framework to, to the police. And, and of course, the, the parliament and government are, are, are the source of, of that. And um, I think a symbol that we could apply here as well is, is the, with a similar context, is the Investigatory Powers Act 2016. When the, the the UK Parliament uh, looking at, at um, interference of communications and, and and data related issues, personal data, they 
they look at all the legislation and said, actually, this is this is not enough. They certainly, in terms of common law, it is unlikely that 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 um, was or it, or it can be considered as a, as a as a legal basis. And they said we need to develop a framework, and they develop a, a quite comprehensive framework through the through the EPA uh, 2016, which is not perfect and has been challenged a couple of times, in, in, even in the Supreme Court. Uh, but it's a framework that 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 gives that legal certainty and. Uh, um, and provide enough safeguards. So uh, probably, as you know, there is an investigatory powers commission between this. There's a, the Intelligence and Security Committee of the UK Parliament has an oversight of, 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 of the legislation. Um, there is an investiga investigatory powers um, tribunal. There are codes of practice. There are like four or five different codes of practice. And, and, and the legislation has also incorporated the, the Wilson Doctrine and the protection of journalists, doctors, and, and, and lawyers, so personal data is not flowing everywhere. And, um, and as you know, a judge serving within the IPC uh, reviews the warrants. So that's, that's something that um, it could um, um, illustrate what what is happening right now and how the the, the, the parliament has um, has reacted to these uh, challenges on modern technology to provide the police with the adequate tools to to do their job can i just ask mr mclean i know we've covered um, the issue of assessments in previous sessions quite a bit in hindsight um i don't know how honest you can be here but in hindsight do you not think police scotland perhaps you know we're a bit premature, jumped the gun with all this, having the rollout without all these issues having been considered. And I know that comes down to assessments. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the issue of cyber chaos, as was alluded to earlier, has opened up a much wider discussion about that complex landscape that the police is trying to operate within. Um, I think the ambition and the sentiment behind kiosk was about a better service delivery and actually to try and minimise some intrusion. Um, what's, what's caused is a, a much wider discussion around about that. Um, my, my personal view is even our view of impact assessments at the very start of this journey still wouldn't have been sufficient for where we are at the moment because I think we're learning every day on the job, if you will, the contributions made by people around the table here and the other contributors to the, to the reference groups really enrich that discussion and certainly our considerations about the wider privacy, safeguards and considerations um, so I think it's a, a journey that we're on. Okay. Anyone else want to comment? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rona. Uh, Stuart. Um, given that the kiosks are essentially doing the same investigatory task um, as the hub is, in a broad sense, um, does this discussion apply equally to what's going on in the hubs? I think, as I said before, then yes, we, we have. It's, it's so. I think cyber kiosks are what has pub brought this to public light, and it's then actually led us to look at it, it as one part in at the chain of how uh, evidence is obtained in criminal cases. Um, and looking at, uh, along that chain, there are questions in other parts, including at the cyber hubs. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. Um, I, just following on, I think from from Rona's line of questioning, um, obviously. Uh, Mr. McLean, I, I, I appreciate your, your candour at a number of sessions now, and I think it's probably only fair to uh, put on record the, the statement from Open Rights Group, um, which welcomes the openness and engagement in the consultation process that Police Scotland uh, have un undertaken. So I, I think, notwithstanding the seriousness of the, the concerns, I think the approach that's been taken by Police Scotland since those uh, concerns uh, came to light um, has been, I think, in encouraging. I, in terms of the, the legislative change that I think, Ms. Connolly, you, you were referring to there, and Mr. Kiros as well, is this something that Scottish Law Commission should be looking at? I mean, I think that there's always a, a risk in, in, in leaping to, to, to pull the, the legislative levers that you end up putting in place something that's fairly rigid. I mean, you're dealing with technology advancing in the way that it is. Um, you, you may find by the time the legislative process is, is completed, you're already behind the eight ball again. Is, is this something that, that, that we should be... In? Um, inviting the Scottish Law Commission to, to look at, or is it something that's more straightforward that, that may require a, 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 a more streamlined legislative fix? I don't think it's straightforward at all. And uh, This is a Pandora's box. 
and it's particularly complex both because of the, the legal side um, and the legal aspects of making such interrogations um, lawfully compliant with the convention and with laws, but we are also trying to keep up with our rapidly expanding technological process body that is almost, it's ahead and we're running behind. And therefore, I think considered and fully researched um, considerations around all possible manifestations in terms of future technological developments by something like the Law Commission would certainly at least give a, an opportunity for any legislation to have some longevity attached to it and, as, and not, as you say, to essentially be out of date by the time it's on the statute book. That takes us into a whole different book. I mean, Mr McLean was, was I, I think, entirely fair in saying that uh, a rollout from December is fairly ambitious. If we're going down the route that, that, that you're suggesting, um, it will be December and, and, and pick a year. And absolutely. And, and this issue, the cyber kiosk, I think, as, as many people have said, has highlighted an, a much broader issue. This isn't just cyber kiosk. This is the use of dash cams uh, in criminal prosecutions. It's the use of the hub. So, so uh, time is of the essence. So I think that we, we, there's a quandary here. This is something that should be carefully considered and carefully looked at but we're up against time, uh, both to make sure that the existing practices are compliant with their convention responsibilities, and also to ensure that we don't have further infringement of people's rights taking place through the use of, for example, reliance on dash cam evidence, etc., which raise similar, very similar points. So, so from what you're saying, um, that would seem to suggest that care and attention in terms of um, what is being done at the moment um, will need to be obviously applied and, and perhaps a review of that. But the rolling out of, of cyber kiosks would, would not be sensible until that legal framework is, is, is in place. Is that? that? That's absolutely correct. And, and there's currently reliance on evidence before the courts um, that certainly it's, com it's compatibility um, and it's, it's um, interference with the Article 8 rights of the individuals involved and the Article 6 rights is of quite grave concern. So an intense expert group to look at this in depth but quickly um, is perhaps what is needed prior to a legislative process being commenced. Do others have views on, on that, Mr Kiros? Uh, I, think, I, I think that's a, that's a different question. The, Different from from the the legality um, uh, of the of the cyber kiosk and, and, and the technique and the particular technique we we are discussing, um, but I think it's an important one and um, and I would say it's up to the parliament and government to decide on that. There are di different paths that can be taken. So um, there are a number of issues that are not only related to cyber kiosk, but um, use of camera, computers, and, and, and other devices. And so there could be a piece of legislation that covers all forensic digital media. And so a piece, a broad, comprehensive piece of legislation. Or there could be an, a different path that, that is, develops a code of, of practice for, for this specific uh, um, issue and is laid uh, before the parliament for, for your oversight. So there are, there are different ways to, to, to go ahead with this, but I, I, I think it, it's important that the, the parliament keeps the, the oversight of, of the process and the scrutiny as, as it has been done uh, so far. Mr. McLean. Thank you. Just a, a convener, sorry, a very quick point. I don't disagree with anything that's said. And, and as a police officer and, and as a police force, we only apply the law that's, that's provided to us. I think it's probably important to say that. But I did say earlier on that you know Scottish law is principally a set of principles, um, and and if you you make one change in one area, then that will adjust those sets of principles. So I think we have to consider the unintended consequences. And by that, what I mean is, if we take a decision uh, or if a decision is made around about cyber kiosks, what are the unintended consequences of that in wider digital forensics, but actually in other parts of the criminal justice system, because those principles that are applied to cyber kiosks, if adopted and supported by way of a review 
then they will be interpreted in other parts of uh, criminal investigation, criminal prosecution. So I think we have to be cautious um, around about and consider every option, as, as Diego said. Uh, exemplify that. Um, uh, where, where would where well, would you I see an obvious obviously read across in the criminal justice system? Well, so, so if if we say that um, because of the potential infringements and lack of safeguards for cyber kiosks, then that would stop all digital forensics. Now, in most cases that we go in front of a, a court or criminal justice system these days will, in some ways, describe our lives, and our lives are surrounded by these digital devices. So that's a consideration. We've got the Article 2 right to life, so in those high-risk situations, such as missing persons or crimes in action, we would denude ourselves of that capability and thereby be un unable to respond or at least limit ourselves in terms of some of our Article 2 obligations. Um, but it may well be much wider than digital forensics, because where do you draw the line in terms of sensitive or personal information? That may not just be in the digital format. So there'll be other aspects of the criminal justice system where if you've adopted one set of principles, there may be unintended consequences and applicable elsewhere. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Clem, but of course, we, we come to be looking at this not because of the hubs, but because of uh, the issue that this was a, a different approach that was being taken and we were trying to understand the wider implications of that. I wonder I can ask you two, two or three specific questions, please. Um, I heard you correctly, you said the cyber chaos don't turn on the phone. Now, at, at our last meeting, uh, Mr. Kiros said that cyber chaos can access texts, photos, web browsing and biometric data, like the fingerprint used to actually turn on the phone. Is that correct? Um, it, it may be correct. So, so what happens with a cyber kiosk is the device, the, the mobile device, let's call it a phone in this instance, is switched off and the SIM card is removed. So it's not connecting to any external source of information, whether that be through a network, uh, Wi-Fi, internet. So it's isolated, and what the cyber kiosk then does is allow some search parameters for you to ask a series of questions about the data that's stored on the device, the, the phone, if that's what it is. That sounded like a um, yes, that, that information can be accessed. And I mean, web browsing history, for instance. It may be possible, but it's, but it's dependent upon the device. And I don't mean to no, not take a position. It very much depends on the technology that's plugged into the kiosk. Yeah. But yes, it's possible. OK. And that would include a fingerprint used to activate the phone? We've asked that question specifically, and I think Mr Kiros was present, and we said that is extremely unlikely that it has the capability to do that. So I think that we can, with some confidence, say no, it wouldn't do that. Well, yeah. Mr Kiros. That's a that's a technical question, uh, and the explanation I, I, I got with this um, is is quite interesting. Is is that um, your fingerprint when is 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 uh, locked into your uh, into your phone is is not a picture of your fingerprint, but is 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 a is a mathematical formula of, of, of that fingerprint. So I I asked exactly that question when I I was with the police. So what it will be very difficult to match that. Um, mathematical formula to to do actual fingerprint. So it's, it's a very complex um, a transition that it has to go from from that decoding of, of a picture to uh, to your picture. Um, is 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 that that correct? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's going to be just my. I, I think um, Mr. Stevenson is <laughs> going to give us some of his uh, knowledge. Well, just as banks don't need to know your PIN number and they don't, to be able to validate whether you put the right one in, in phones and that sort of thing, it is a one-way algorithm, takes the image and produces an answer from which you cannot derive the original data. And that is repeated every time you offer it. So you cannot take the data and work out what it's come from because it's what's termed a one-way algorithm, uh, using a mat matrix transformation corner to corner, if you want the technical explanation. Hi, we all do that, sure. No? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, yes, Mr. Sakira, sorry. Uh, thank you for that uh, enlightenment. And, uh, and, but it doesn't make it less, less intrusive, uh, obviously, because um, there's other type of biometric, obviously, that that it can be uh, uh, downloaded, uh, voice, uh, uh, um, and also pictures, so, uh, other material that is incredibly personal about the individual, the, the um, his or her personal relations, and 
identity and even third parties. Mr. McLean, I wonder if I, I could try an example, and forgive me if we, we, we've run this example before, but it's to understand but an easier concept for me, and that's the, the notion of consent. So, to some extent, uh, an accused and a, a, and a suspect will have a, a measure of protection. A, a witness, if someone, for instance, who is a complainer, is to say, I, I've been sent an offensive image, and they were to present themselves as a police station with one of these cyber kiosks, would the cyber kiosk be used to establish if indeed there was an, an indecent image. And in the process of so doing, would it be able to uh, look beyond, if they said, I've just received it, within the last hour someone sent me an offensive image, could the parameters of the search be limited to that time frame? Or? So the straightforward answer is yes, and, and that is the whole intention of the kiosks, <coughs> is to, as a triage process. So, you know, officers, the thin blue line is, is very stretched, as you know, convener. Um, they want to ask the question and get the answer on it. So the whole intention of the kiosk is to try and eliminate the devices at an early stage if they can and return them to the owners and thereby provide a much better service to the investigation at the front end and, and the public and the owners of these devices, whether they be witnesses or victims or actually whether they even be accused or suspects, is to try and get them off our shelves and back in the, the hands of the, the, the right owner. Um, so to answer your question more specifically, what the kiosk allows you to do is ask it that specific question. So in that date, in that time parameter between those dates was an offensive image or a text message or whatever the, the matter is under investigation, was that delivered? And, and it will then throw up the, the results. So um, it, it is limited in terms of its capability as are the officers to look through the whole catalogue of images and data on the device. The intention is to interrogate the phone by asking it a series of questions via the kiosk. So. The concern, the, the wide concern there would be about the deployment of these might be um, that police could go on a fishing expedition, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that, that position put. Um, as I say, one of the, some of the checks and balances and safeguards that we're putting in is through the, the training programme with the operator, so it will not be the actual investigator who may be unduly influenced or has a desire to try and prove the case, if you will. So those safeguards are in part by the supervisory checks that will be in place. The, the operators, and they will consider many of the articles that need to be thought about proportionality, necessity, collateral intrusion, understanding the matter that's been investigated, what is it the investigating officer wants to try and get from the device, and then it's those separate officers that will interrogate the device and come back with the results for the investigating officer. So we think we've put in some checks and balances around about that. Ms Connolly, would you care to comment on that? I think my concern remains in that there's, there's, there's parameters of search going to be put in. It cannot be targeted at the single thing that's being looked for. Um, in many cases, one would anticipate. And whilst there might not be a fishing exercise actually being carried out, the way the law operates is that when a search is taking place, that should incriminating material um, become a cro come across by police officers in the course of a search, even if that's out with the, the limits of a search warrant, for example, that becomes admissible. So the question of fishing exercise, although strictly speaking, it is not allowed in law, where incriminating material is come across by accident or in the process of carrying out a search, that is deemed to be admissible evidence. And on that particular example, then, Mr. McLean, I don't know if someone were to receive two images that might be deemed indecent, they're unhappy because the sender of one, but they're not bothered about the other. Would that could that turn a complainer into an accused? Um, so I, I suppose I can't judge on every eventuality. I think the point is about self-incrimination. So this goes back to probably less about an accused person. I, would, I sense, and perhaps more about a victim or a witness. And the fact that we have no compulsion over victims or witnesses to give over div digital devices for examination. So there would have to be a voluntary element. Uh, I think the, the quality of law and some of the things we've talked about earlier is we need to be more explicit in what that actually means and what their expectations are within that. And clearly, if there was content which, you know, in that searching process, and, and this is true of, of many other where it's, you're actually searching a failing cabinet, let alone a digital device, if you were to come across something that indicated other criminality, perhaps of a grave nature, then as a, as a police officer, you have some responsibilities towards that. 
it's at that point it becomes extremely complex in terms of what powers were you utilising at that time uh, and did they empower you to, to take a course of action in terms of that new material or at that point should you stop and give it much wider consideration which is ordinarily what the guidance is to police officers? On one level, it's, it's, it can be very simple, but then there's all these qualifying conditions. I get that. Were you able to share the advice, the internal advice, that legal advice that you got from Police Scotland with the committee? Um, <coughs> and can you advise I, what format that took, please? Um, so that was that was a memo which um, I can take on, under consideration whether or not it can be shared with the committee, because obviously there's a question about legal advice to, to ourselves. Um, but, but in effect, reiterating some of the things I've said before is that um, the, the legal advice is that there is a lawful power, that there is a statutory powers under the Criminal Justice Act I've talked about before, and again, that that's supported by case law within the last 10 or 11 years. So there's two points of case law, which I think we've already alluded to before, from about 1997 and 2014, which seem to support the powers that the police have used at that time to uh, examine digital devices. So um, that was the advice that was given to us that the assurances I've given here before are as the legal view internally within Police Scotland. I'm not sure I understand how you would share legal advice provided by Crown Office, but you wouldn't share your internal advice, legal advice. Why, why would that be? Um, I would probably have to take some direction that if you wouldn't mind on that convener. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can, 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 yeah. Thank you. Well, if you could, Mr McLean, and come back to us, because I think yes. it, it, it would be very helpful. I recognise the importance of a yeah. convener. Yes. Can I ask about the... I'll bring in Surya. Um, can I ask about any assessment that's been done of the potential for any retrospective claims when the trial period was ongoing without all the supporting framework that's now in place, or discussions at least? Uh, has anyone come forward and complained? Not, not to my knowledge um, that, I, that I'm aware of, but I'm sure there are many people who will be watching with, the, with this with interest. You know, and uh, um, a lot of the discussion about is about what police officers are or not doing and are they infringing the various articles, which probably takes me back as to why I might want to take some advice on whether or not we can share some of that legal piece. But to my knowledge and answer to your question, not that I'm aware. Mr Kiros, thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I just wanted to go back to your point on um, of fishing expedition and and, and uh, after after the, the 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 previous meeting with the committee, um, um, Mr. McLean invited me to to uh, go and see how the the cyber kiosk, cyber kiosk worked and um, and um, and and I would say that the the issue of, of operational proportionality is something that the police has considered quite carefully. So these these parameters that that he, he mentioned, um, so I I I, I have a bit less concern for the evidence that I, I received about that that the legal certainty and and, and the requirement of lawfulness, but certainly that 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 point of of um, that that you raise relates back to to the point of oversight. And that's why we recommend that um, prior judicial authorization or, or an independent body is, should be seen as the, as the best preferable practice for, for the use of, of cyber, cyber kiosk, because the, then there is that, that independent oversight that is required to ensure that there is no this type of, uh, of, of, of practices or, or, or what, what is called um, fishing expeditions. And, and this, by the way, seems to be the, the, the preferred approach of the in, regard, in regards of uh, communications, interception of communications by both the, the, the European Court of Human Rights, and, um, and that was the case quite recently, a month ago, in the uh, Big Brother uh, Watch case against the UK, but also by the Court of Justice of the European Union in, in the Watson and, um, and Teletrol Esbarie uh, case, where, where it seems that they, seem, they, they favor clearly uh, independent uh, oversight of, of, of an authorization process. Could I drill down a little bit in the independent oversight? And clearly, it's not a blanket one for every um, every mobile phone browsing ex, um, example or, or you know exercise. How would it work in practice? Would it be only would it only be when something was flagged up as being unsuitable that the mobile phone um, browsing exercise has covered, or how would the independent oversight work in practice? Mr. Kiros. 
I think that there are different ways how it can work. It could, it could be prior or post, as you're saying. And so prior is a, a, a due authorization that is, is given, and all, all post is, is a review of the authorization that are given, and similar to what happens with the pro, uh, protection orders in, 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 in relation to, to um, the Investigatory Powers Act which is uh, that it, the order are given by a, a chief su superintendent of the police, but is the, the, the commission who reviews the, the, that valid, validity and, and, and adequacy of, of the orders post they are issue. There is a big issue here, um, given that we're, we're looking at the, the police act just now. We're looking at, if you like, the shifting, the initial, um, looking at whether there's a complaint here, it would be whether it's um, right to have the mobile phone browsing exercise. Would that be not a strong indication that it should take place prior as opposed to after? The, the exercise are taken out and therefore it was dependent on some issue being raised. Perhaps. Yeah, I would, I would say that's the, the preferable option, yeah. And it seems that the, both the, the, the European Court of Human Rights and and the, and the Court of Justice of the European Union are, are signaling that that's what should happen in, in, in the European context. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Yes, thank you. Oh, no. um, yes, Mr. McLean, you've mentioned a couple of times that the device has to be provided voluntarily. I'm just curious to know if an individual says to you, if you approach an individual and they say, no, you're not going to, have, you're not going to get my phone, what happens then? Is, is that as far as it goes? Or is that person then sort of, you know, marked out as being suspicious because they've refused? Um, I'm just curious to know what the procedure would be in that case. So I think what we're asked the question, would we be carrying these devices down the street and stopping people and browsing their phones? That's absolutely not, not what they're intended for. So the principle intended for where a matter has been reported to the police, a crime or, or some sort of investigation. Um, and when I talk about compulsion, what I mean is the victims or the witnesses in those sets of circumstances. So we have no powers to, to require those devices, um, other than perhaps going through a court and getting a warrant if we thought it was such a grave matter. So I just have this aspect, you have the power, whether it's, so it's not voluntary. Is that the difference? Exactly. Yeah, OK. That's fine. All right, thank you. That's fine. Stuart, thanks. Uh, I, I just wanted to see if there was a, a sort of parallel, and I'm not so fully familiar with the Act to, to be certain about the question I'm asking. Under the Regulatory Investigative Powers Act, the, the, one of the things that people can be required to provide is their, is their encryption keys so that data could, and even an innocent person who refuses to provide the, de, the key that would de-encrypt then will become someone who's committed a, an offence under that. I'm getting odd, so <coughs> I'm really just trying to explore whether there are, in that, there is a principle captured that we can look at that we might think about for other domains such as we're now discussing. I would love to be able to give you a very specificity, if I can even say that, uh, answer to that question, Mr Stevenson, which is, um, so the Regulatory Investigative Powers Act is principally a lot of covert activity. You're right, yeah. we, we can require an order for, for the PIN number. Um, I think it's difficult to cover to cover every eventuality, and when we talk about kiosks, as Mr. McArthur mentioned, it's a much wider set of principles. So it's very difficult to give to give one set of circumstances that meets meets every scenario. And, and I go back to the, some of the Article Two obligations that policing have about right to life and those very high risk situations. So um, these these options that we have discussed um, have a, a degree of time wrapped around about them, and, and often that's the complex situation that police are trying to operate within. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the more we take evidence uh, on these chaos, the, the more concerning it becomes. And I, I think there, there, there probably is, um, there, or there probably would be good procedures in place and through working on the Justice Committee and um, uh, in other areas, I, I, I believe that would be the case. But I think that there's also a public perception there that we've talked about. And, you know, some of the other evidence we're taking, there's some real progress being made uh, in people coming forward um, uh, around certain uh, types of offences where maybe they wouldn't have previously um, and we don't want to go back the way in, in, in these sort of issues and I think that if, if a committee of MSPs are, are concerned with these I think the public would be concerned as well and you might get situations where people go and say 
you know, I want to report this, but I don't want my whole phone checked, that sort of thing. So with that in mind, um, I, I wanted to follow on that theme and ask about the training. I believe that the police are carrying on uh, the, the training of officers and the use of cyber chaos, but do you think that's a, a good use of um, police time just now, given the concerns that have been raised and that there, this may be stalled until further safeguards are put in place? Um. Yeah, I take your point. So I think in terms of the public concerns, that comes back, back to the quality of law piece and, and we recognise that it's really important to set out those principles and articulate them clearly so that people understand what their expectations would be, whether they have been arrested for a crime or whether they are a victim or witness to, to an incident. Um, in terms of the training piece, that was a, a, a careful balance in terms of logistical challenges <coughs> in training over 400 people. And I, I think I said before this committee, we'd set out, out a timeline. So where we are very considered around about an operational deployment or a go live, if you'd wish to call it that, at the same time we're trying to minimise the disruption to our local policing resources. Um, that that is not without its its challenge. So one of the decisions and probably the defining factor about commencing the training was so that we could do a proper evaluation to see how actually the training product was fit for purpose and where we are addressing a lot of the matters that we've discussed here today and in the margins of this meeting and what was the experience of those officers that were training, did they feel they were adequate? So for me, that was the primary driver about commencing the training to allow us to do a full evaluation, which has started this week, and we're doing a full debrief of those officers within the next two to three weeks to get a feedback to see, do we even think we've got this right in terms of the training and are we catering for all the... The, the safeguards, checks and balances and considerations that we've talked about here today and elsewhere. OK, thank you very much. Can I maybe just conclude with one question? I, 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 I think we've heard from Police Scotland that perhaps they would go about things slightly different and you know, some of the issues, you know, having a pilot, acquiring that significant capital sum to acquire the, the equipment. Could I ask um, each of the witnesses in turn, it's probably just a simple yes or no, please, uh, are you content the cyber chaos should be rolled out in December or should we await a definitive yes from Crown Office and importantly a sign off from the members of the current stakeholder group? I don't think they should be rolled out in December, it's premature and I, th I think that um, m more than just the response from Crown Office is required and in that the, the, the law has to be um, reassessed, re-evaluated and perhaps redrafted to meet the challenges of not only the cyber chaos, but the use of technology in the modern world. Okay, thanks, Ms Connolly. Mr Freeland. We need to be clear on, on the lawful basis that needs to ex be expressed to us in, in clear and straightforward terms, and until such time as that happens, um, I, I can't say that the processing of personal data would be lawful. Okay, thank you. Mr McLean. Um, I think there's a lot of ground to be covered if we could even uh, project a rollout in December, but I don't think the discussion is hinged just on about cyber chaos. I think it's a much wider discussion and possible review and recommendations. So I don't think we should frame the discussion just on about chaos. But could we roll them out in December? At this time, that looks unlikely. We, we need to take a very measured approach to this. Okay, can I ask you then, Mr McLean, Police Scotland wouldn't roll that out without um, a definitive opinion given from uh, the Crown Office. I note that in one of the uh, responses, Police Scotland talk about they may reasonably expect that Crown Office Property to Fiscal Service to consider the legal basis for the use of cyber uh, chaos as, quote, an operational matter for policing. Well, I, I'm sure you accept it's broader than a policing interest. Um, I think, Convener, um, I'm here obviously representing Police Scotland. It will be for the force to, to make that decision. And that will probably start somewhere at chief officer level and perhaps the, the SRO for the programme. Um, clearly, they will they will take cognizance of what Crown Office um, is response to that, as well as all the other contributions that we've received to date. Well, you can say it won't go ahead unless we get the go ahead from the stakeholder group and Crown Office. I don't think I could make that commitment here today, no, convener. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Kiros. Uh, no, the the answer to that is no. The 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 current law is. It's not clear. There is no, there is no, a clear basis in, in domestic law, and that relates again to the lawfulness. And the law doesn't have a sufficient quality uh, as to be accessible and foreseeable, and, um, and 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 that relates to legal certainty. And and there are no adequate uh, safeguard, safeguards uh, in place in 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 the law. 
because I, I would argue that the, the legislator never thought about uh, those situations of seizure and, 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 and search in, in this context. Okay, can I thank all the witnesses very much indeed for the written submissions for coming today and Ms Connolly, I know there were challenges with you, so thank you for, for, for making the time available. That's been very helpful and if you could share the, maybe the information we discussed or examine that, Mr McLean, that would be appreciated. Uh, we now move into private session. Thank you very much.